Uh, Don Dizon is our, is our speaker. He's a medical oncologist at MGH. Um, and he uh, is currently a member of the Gillette Center for Gynecologic Oncology and has founded and directed the Oncology Sexual Health Program here. Um, he's done a lot of things, got a lot of awards, publishes a lot of articles. He's very big in social media, has been tweeting, I think, from his seat all morning long. Um, and I just want to say something uh, a, a little more uh, personal about Don, even though I don't know him very well. He's only been at MGH a couple of years, two, three years. And I've, I will say I've had about three conversations with him that were maybe 10 minutes each in my life. Um, however, I consider myself a quick study and a fairly good judge of character. And my judgment of our next speaker boils down to this. He's a keeper. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Don Dizon. I know it's a challenging thing to be speaking now, um, particularly because I'm standing in the way of lunch. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to be a very engaging talk with this audience. Um, and just to, as, before I start, just to something Felicia and all said, when I came here, um, MGH uh, welcomed me very actively. And one of the things that Dave Ryan and Mara Blum let me do for this community was open a sexual health program. And all I had to say to them to let me do it was the words, at least you're alive, are not appropriate. All right? So if anybody in this audience needs or wants to discuss sexual health, these guys let me bring this program to MGH. And so with that, I will start this talk. And um, David had asked me to do a talk that was not science or um, uh, a review of what I treat. Um, and I was thinking about how I could help inform one very important truth you all need to know about those of us on this side of the cancer equation. Every single person we touch and every life we are led into changes us as clinicians. And I'm hoping to express some of the truths um, about living with cancer that not only inform how I think we can all do it, but by we, I include ourselves in this equation as well. This is a picture um, that was taken last week. Um, actually, no, it's a, it's a picture from college. Um, <laughs> you're looking at it, it's like, wow, he's aged. Yeah, wow. So this was actually taken in the 1980s. And these are friends of mine who I met as freshmen, and we graduated together. Um, and I, it was one of those friendships where you thought, no matter where we are in our stages of life, we are always going to know each other. And it was that kind of friendship where six and eight months would go by and you wouldn't hear from them. But when you heard from them, it was like no time has ever passed. Um, the woman on the left is my friend Christina. And the woman on the right is my friend Gunjan. Uh, it was three years ago where I got a call from Christina. And it, this was not uncommon. I hadn't heard from her for about a year. In the meantime, I'd known she'd had her second child, who by the time she called me would have been about six months. That's typically when she'll call me to let me know that, oh, by the way, I had a child, and I'd already known that. And so I was um, hoping for that welcome call, and she answered the phone, and she was quite serious. Um, and it turned out that uh, her next words were this, I have cancer. Turned out she, was, she had a blocked duct while breastfeeding. And that side of her breast, her child wouldn't bond or latch onto her nipple. Um, she tried to get rid of it using some hot water soaks. Uh, but it just got bigger. Um, she was so young that the, the thought never entered into her mind. It was serious until um, her axilla started to swell. So by the time she called me and had a biopsy, she had advanced breast cancer and was calling me to let me know what was going on. And her voice was the deer in the headlights look. And all she heard was it was a bunch of stuff. And all I heard was cancer. And they kept saying cancer. And there's cancer in your breast. And there's cancer in your axilla. And as they said cancer, she kept retreating. And she was inside of herself. And she didn't know what to do. And inside, she was screaming. And she was angry. 
because as most of us who get into our 40s, it takes a while to find your legs. And it took her a longer while than most to find a man that she fell in love with, to find a career path um, where she thought she was going to be most useful. And she had had children she had always wanted. And this was diagnosed six months after she had her, her, her second son. And she really felt like life was going to pass by her. And she felt very much not in control. And what she said to me that day was that cancer just sucks. Kelly said this more beautifully, but it did. And what it meant to her, and I think it, what it means, and we understand what it means no matter what the cancer is, is that you see roads closing off. And that people see opportunities being taken away. You see your life being medicalized as appointments come at you all the time. And what she feared most was a loss of control. This is normal. The anger, the sadness, the loss of control. This is the normal reaction to being told you have cancer. And it's normal to mourn what is, what cannot be, and what the future may hold. So feel it. Own it, and then embrace it, because this is your truth. Because only then can you move on. And that's what we ask of anybody who's been diagnosed with cancer. We need to move on from this point. Because cancer forced her, and I think it forces every one of you who has been diagnosed or helps someone you love face a diagnosis, it forces all of us to evolve. And one never knows how strong you are until after it's happened. Strength doesn't come from what you can do. Strength comes from overcoming the things you thought you couldn't. For Christina, it was really envisioning with her that this was going to be a mountain to climb. But it was only going to be climbed one step at a time, and that we were going to help her do it. I did not become her oncologist. And like well, the nurse who doesn't want to be a doctor but wants to be a patient, I became a caregiver. So I heard what her doctors were recommending. I did not insert my opinion. And that was very, very difficult. But I think the hardest thing for me to realize um, is that Christina had to make that conscious decision. She could retreat or she could, she could confront it. And she actually made that conscious decision. You know what? I want to live. Like Billy Joe said it. I want to live as long as I can. I want to see my children. I want to see them grow up. I want to see what happens. So I'm going to fight. She called me and she had this question, though. Can I do this? And I think every single person who doesn't have cancer has a visceral reaction to the what if you get cancer. And it's, I'm never doing chemo. I'm never doing surgery. If it happens to me, that's it. But I think it was said very well. Nikki said it. You just don't know what you're going to do unless you're confronted with it. And to this, I have said to my own patients, can I do this? Yes, you can. Yes, you must. And yes, because you have no choice. And I will help you do that thing you think you cannot do. And that's where that relationship must build. But after cancer, we also know the panel is just so um, beautiful about stating this. Life does change. This is, these are pictures from Angelo Merendino, who chronicled his wife's um, course with breast cancer. Every step of the way, she changed. That wonderful, beautiful, and young appearing woman drinking a beer on a, a step in New York City, he watched her get sick. And he watched her get chemotherapy and he watched her get weak. After cancer, like Kelly said, it does change things. So what have I learned from the experience of being an oncologist about living? What have I learned about uh, living with cancer? What did I want Christina to know about living with cancer can be summarized in three things, and it's mentioned in the panel, which is a great segue here. You have to approach life pragmatically How's that in realism? But never have anybody take away your optimism. That's a hard thing to do, but I think it's possible. 
So if you think about what exactly I mean by pragmatism, it's really about practicality. It's conduct that emphasizes a practical approach to problems. And I think when it comes to cancer, it is where you get your say in creating that plan for therapy that is so individualized. If you live six hours away from Boston, it may not be practical for you to have therapy weekly. If you live in China, it might be more practical to take oral therapy. If you have to pick up your children at 3 o'clock because you are their caregiver, you may not be able to stay six hours. And you know what? That's OK. Because at the end of the day, I can't take your chemotherapy. I can't do that surgery for you. And I'm not the one who's going to sit through 32 days of radiation therapy. At the end of the day, no one else has to walk in your shoes. So that's where you have rights as a patient in this cancer center. All right? We can help individualize plans. We can help individualize anything we do because we need to realize you are the one who are asking to do these things. It also means being pragmatic in emphasizing priorities. All of us have very busy lives. I have to go to a birthday party at 2, but I'm here, you know. But we need to find ways, and you need to critically look at your own life like Christina did, emphasizing those things you really need to do versus those things you want to do and versus those things you wish you could do. Because when you're facing cancer, it's a social disease. Okay? It's all about you. But we also need to recognize it's all about those people in your life as well who are all impacted by a cancer diagnosis. So translating practicality to realism is a tendency to look at things as they really are. And I think what you heard today with this panel is their reality of living with cancer. And I think every single one of us could identify with one, if not all, of those stories. But realistic in cancer means preparing for an uncertain present and an even more uncertain future. Despite my best intentions, I cannot guarantee cure. You can be stage one with breast cancer, stage one with melanoma, and I cannot guarantee you that you will be OK 30 years down the road. So the realistic view after cancer is confronting the fact that life is uncertain and preparing for that reality. It might mean, and I will bring in again my friend Christina, it meant when she was originally diagnosed, she made out her will and she made out her care plan. And she told her doctors what she would want if things went bad. She also went the step further, which was, I was like, I don't know if that's really necessary. But she picked out a, ca a casket at the point of her diagnosis. And she didn't do that because she had a morbid fascination with her death. But like you heard on the panel, it was her way to confront a reality and control it. Okay. So these are things um, that I think are important. These are not guidelines for anyone in this audience to take. All right. But the reality of cancer is one that we all confront. But you don't need to do that alone. No matter who is in your life, whether you're married or not, um, uh, you have children or not, you are part of a community. And no one needs to go through a cancer treatment alone. In fact, I will go on to say, having spoken to her husband, oftentimes those who are witnessing what you are going through are having a harder time because they are powerless to help. They cannot take your chemo. They cannot do your surgery. And it pains us to see you go through something that we can't help. And that is a reality as well. But being realistic does not mean losing your individuality. It does not mean abandoning those things that we feel are important in our own lives. And it does not mean giving up our control for the things we want to do. Part of being realistic is to confront and enforce who we are as people. And never think that that's going to be something you need to abandon. So 
if you think about being realistic, it almost stands in contradiction to being optimistic. But if you think about optimistic optimism, it's being hopeful. And it's being confident that something might be successful no matter how you choose to define success. And I think hope is something that we can never take away from anyone, um, no matter what the situation is. Optimism is faith, it's love, it's belief, and it is hope. Where I sit, optimism is a clinical trial. And I made up this slide when I read about a woman who had uh, advanced lung cancer who wanted a vaccine study, but the only way she could do it was on a clinical trial which randomized against placebo. She wrote an editorial saying, I don't want to be a guinea pig, but I really want that vaccine. And from where I sit, the connotation of a clinical trial participant as a guinea pig is a, an absolutely incorrect view. Because I think people who participate in clinical trials are the trailblazers in cancer therapy. This is how we are going to fight to make things better. But being an optimist in doing those trials means we need to be realistic about what we expect those trials to do for us. There are phases of trials. We need to make sure that we are all understanding what any trial is meant to do, whether phase one, phase two, or phase three. But ultimately, hope for better is what drives clinical research, and it's what drives research on all fronts. It's what you want us to do, and it is what we, are, we would like to do as well. So after cancer, recognize that your life holds lessons, not only for you, but for your families. Uh, and it holds lessons for us who care for you and the more professional aspects. And I purposely did not say your doctor, because I think your life holds lessons for your nurses, your social workers, everyone that contacts you within a cancer center. But as it has been already mentioned by Kelly, your life will be changed. There is no such thing as going back to who you were before cancer. We talk about a new normalcy. What is never said, it's not automatic. It is a process of rediscovery. And it's a process where you reevaluate your goals in your own life. You may even celebrate that as a new birthday. And I will tell you this whole notion of cancer birthdays is probably the one thing that is consistent across very severe illnesses. My dad celebrated every year after his initial near fatal heart attack. And he celebrated that more happily than his own birthday. Okay. It is the same experience we have in cancer. But cancer does not need to make you feel worse. And I think that was another point here. We have at our resources in MGH and in many comprehensive cancer centers the ability to help you with whatever is bothering you currently, whether it's fatigue, sexual health, chemo brain. We can point you to resources. You need to let us know how to help. And by us, Again, I'm not mentioning the oncologist, but someone in your care team can walk you through that path. There's a, there's a term that is incredibly scary, even today, and it's palliative care. To hear that term means that you're dying, and it may not be the oncologist to use it. But really, the message here is not to be afraid of palliative care. This is groundbreaking work from Mass General. It's the only slide I have. But palliative care interventions early on, before you're dying, just because you have symptoms, to have someone to talk to about that diagnosis, to help you, you know, envision what your life might look like, to have the support to make medical decisions, also improves survival. And it improved survival by at least three months. If I showed you this graph and I said it was the newest $15,000 pill, this would be all over the New York Times. Something as simple as giving you support can also help us all live, and that is not a new message. So why does all of this, why does any of this matter? 
I think it's because um, living, trying to live pragmatically, yet housing that in real, rea uh, reality, but never losing hope with optimism can help inform something within your life, within the lessons we teach to others, and can help inform how we interact with each other. Because your life is also your legacy. Okay, it's not about money. It's not about being able to set up your own foundation. It's not about that house on the Cape you're gonna live, leave to the, your most favored son or daughter. The words you write, the conversations you've had, are the ones that people will remember. And this came to me when uh, my best friend from college, who I'd met as a freshman, we had the same birthday. He had six sisters and I had four. Um, he took me in, he was a junior in, in college when I was a freshman. And throughout that whole experience, I thought this was gonna be a friend forever. But when he graduated, we lost touch. But every time I thought about him on my birthday, I looked forward to the day we were gonna meet again because it was gonna be a one hell of a reunion. And then he died. And I never saw him. And I realized that even though he would never came back into my life, even though there was no memorial fund set up in his name, he had changed me. He had made me a better father. He had made me want to be a doctor. And for those he loved and left behind, I hope they know he mattered. The world will be a better place because all of us have walked here. I'm certain that you will influence others just like my friend influenced me. So in conclusion, I want us all to get busy living, regardless of whether or not we have cancer. The lessons that oncology holds for me as an oncologist is that I need to get busy living. I need to try to be more pragmatic, I need to be more realistic, but I should never give up the truth that is held in being optimistic. So I either get busy living or we get busy dying. That was from the Shawshank Redemption. It's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> I didn't make it up. And with that, I'll close. And I'll just say, if you want to go on Twitter, I've been posting under this hashtag of MGH after cancer. Um, and if you've never done Twitter, now would be a really nice time for you guys to try to figure out how it's done, because it's kind of cool. But this is my contact information. I do write a blog for ASCO and ASCO Connection. But I hope this was helpful, um, and thank you so much. Yeah. So that last picture um, was the last weekend I spent with her. And I was the one who told her she was dying. I wasn't going to talk about that. <laughs> did, did where you go to med school teach you how to be this real? Because I, no, and I, I have a problem with a lot of the doctors that I see are never this frank and real. And I really enjoy the honesty and just that earnest way of speaking to people like they're not idiots. So I, I want to thank you for that and sort of figure out how you got that and if it's going to spread. I wrote a post recently. Um, I, I blog quite a bit for ASCO. Um, and I find that writing stories has helped inform um, how I've done things in the past. And it's really that um, sense of um, retrospect introspection um, that I think is so important with narratives. Um, I think there's an incredibly um, dueling thoughts that every oncologist has and struggles with about providing care, not getting too close. Um, and each of us is so different in that regard. Um, so I think it has been time that's, that's helped me do this. And I think going into this space where I'm not an oncologist, but I wear the hat in sexual health, 
has also made me appreciate um, the experience beyond just remission, relapse discussions. Um, and then quite honestly, um, seeing and going through the process with Christina just added a whole new layer to medicine for me. But thank you for that. <laughs> I don't really have a question, um, but your information was a gift to all of us. Thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Torres. I'm visiting from Mexico City. I'm a breast cancer patient myself. I was diagnosed when I was 24, but currently I'm working with Dr. Felicia Noel uh, on improving palliative care access in Mexico. Um, I studied law, I work for the Mexican Supreme Court, so uh, we are studying the legal framework and we're trying to improve it. But one of the problems that we face is that um, people tend to refuse palliative care. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you make the transition, or if there's any transition between um, the, you know, normal care and palliative care, and because people tend to think that it's giving up when they want to fight. Right. So that's my question. So, so I think that's a, that's a brilliant question. And I think there has been a, a dilemma um, that's going on in American medicine. And actually, um, without knowing it, uh, Dave Ryan sort of helped me inform it better because I was thinking about it, but I didn't know how to phrase it. Where does survivorship start and stop and palliative care begin and end is a really important question because as I stated, Palliative care coming in earlier can help every one person with cancer probably survive longer. But that is the space where we also want to feel we're helping you live through cancer as a survivor or even as a thriver. What was so interesting is there, there is a concept that was shown at MD Anderson that if you called a palliative care clinic a supportive care clinic, you increase referrals in and you increase the amount of people who came in. Exact same services, but the branding is so important. So at um, Kaiser, they didn't call it a survivorship clinic because not everybody in the room probably sees themselves as a survivor. They called it a, a lifestyle clinic, okay? So moving forward after cancer, addressing lifestyle modification was more accepting because the people were not being branded. And I think that's a really important thing we need to think about, not only at MGH, but across the nation and the world. So my advice to Mexico is not to brand it as palliative care, but offer all the same services and call it supportive. You hear so much uh, about cancer today than when I was growing up. And I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but will there ever be a day when no one will be dying from cancer? What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know what, I think there will be a day where, and, and we do not, I sometimes get criticized for calling cancer a chronic disease because this, this has, like Billy Joe's reality is, this chronic disease is most certainly gonna kill her at some point. And although you can say that about heart disease and you can totally say it about diabetes, the, the, the life expectancy that anyone with metastatic cancer feels is so much shorter than any others. But I do think we're gonna see the day where the majority of people will be living with cancer and living after cancer. And it's coming in spurts, but you're seeing it in lung cancer as we identify mutations that say these patients will not only um, respond to this treatment, we can stop that cancer from growing if we do this treatment for them. Case in point, a friend of mine in my South Pacific home of Guam was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in her bones. 
She went through three cycles of chemotherapy with barely a response, but I knew enough because of the work done in centers like this to make sure that she had her tumor uh, tested for mutations. She had a, a mutation in one pathway, and there is a drug available for it. 14 months later, she has experienced a remission, and she's experienced that remission off chemotherapy. And I think that is gonna be the gold standard as we make mo moves forward, smaller trials, more specific populations, and let's try to see if we can convert this thing into a chronic disease. Mine isn't a question, but I just wanted to tell you that I like the way you said you don't go back to where you were, because so many people say, oh, you'll be just the same as you always were. And yeah. it's like Robert Frost's poem, the road, not, the road Not Taken, because once you go down that road, if you try the other one, you're not the same. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And in fact, so a lot of folks who come see me in the sexual health program, it's that more global issue. It's like, yes, you know, I wanted, I didn't know who else to talk to, and, and sex hurts, definitely, but everything hurts. Mentally it hurts, physically it hurts, and I just don't know what to do. I will let you know that we do have an incredible behavioral health program here that are my partners in dealing with aspects of adjustment. And that's what we're talking about. Adjusting after cancer therapy is not something anyone should get the impression happens automatically and happens uh, quickly. It's a process. So just back to your uh, previous comment, yeah. could you say what the mutation was and yeah. what the drug was? Okay. Yeah, it was an EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor mutation, and she went on an EGFR inhibitor called, I think it was uh, erlotinib, is what she ended up going on. Yeah. Um, on the palliative qu care question, I wonder what you think of the approach. I went through that MGH, and I'm also aware of the, uh, the impact in other countries. Yeah. What do you think of the of approaching it as the framework in which pain can be addressed that's not being addressed in, in the other framework outside of palliative care? Well, I think that's one of the issues that we deal with in, in palliative care. Um, I had an opportunity to discuss this issue with a lot of the thought leaders on this. Uh, you know, they would really like to make sure patients have access to pain control. That is a major aspect of palliative care. Um, but whether or not it works in systems where they would be brought in and, and essentially open up a, an entirely new service or just educate them through the members who are already there is a constant source of struggle because you have to realize palliative care as a specialty is just emerging in the last five years as a dedicated specialty in medicine. That's why I like this idea of calling it what it is, which is a symptomatic care um, approaches because it does get away from this idea that if you're having severe cancer-related pain, you need to go to palliative care versus you let's get just make sure that pain is controlled and not matter what it's called. Just as a caveat to that, when Christina was referred to palliative care when she was diagnosed with brain metastases, she was told by her oncologist exactly the model that I, I also ascribe to, which is we're gonna institute palliative care to help you live with this cancer and so that you don't have to worry about all these other things and we can help you make decisions. When she went into her home and had the intake and the same thing happened with my father, she was told, you need to sign this form that says you're aware your prognosis is less than six months. <laughs> so I think there is, a, there is an, in, an impetus on us as clinicians to not only refer to palliative care but also to address the issues of prognosis when we do it. And just as an aside, Christina lived far longer than six months, just so you know. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dixon, I appreciated your uh, warmth and your directness. Um, I asked this question last year, and I'm still asking this question, which is, I appreciate so much the research for cancer. 
uh, in terms of alleviating the situation. What is going on with the energy of alleviating the environmental causes for it, such as the water that was not appropriate in Camp Lejeune, Twa all the military came down with basically breast cancer, men, um, the parabens and other crap, excuse me, in the cosmetic industry whereby there are companies that don't have the kind of stuff that, ca that is carcinogenic in these products, but there is, like the tobacco industry, such a backlash and money in the cosmetic industry that lobby against FDA regulations, not to mention walking down the supermarket aisles and reading the labels. <laughs> no, I was stopping right. at that point. Right. Thank you very much. I think, uh, and I appreciate your response. Sure. Um, I will say uh, the answer is not much. That is your answer. Not much is being done about that because, and I think in truth, we deal with a society, not only American society, but I think everyone's frame and conceptual model of cancer is if it didn't happen to me or anyone I know, then I don't need to worry about it. So if I didn't have to drink that water in Camp Lejeune, I don't really care. And unfortunately, I think there is, there has to be three things. There has to be medical rationale or science behind it. There has to be political capital, and there has to be a groundswelling of grassroots support for anything in this country or otherwise to get done. And until those three things align, environmental causes of cancer are not likely to be addressed. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> a year or two ago, uh, I did not know the definition of a caregiver and just what a caregiver was supposed to do. On a personal level, uh, my family and I would like to <clears throat> thank my uh, wife's oncologist and his team for the care and the wonderful job they have done. And on a group level here today, I think we all need to thank um, the doctors and all the staff who apparently are volunteers here today and coming out and putting on this presentation. I think you've done a great job, and we thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So let's um, give a hand for Dr. Dizon. We're not going to keep you from lunch uh, for much longer, but um, we, we 